Nashville, Tennessee is home to some of the world's finest musicians. From country music to R&B to hip-hop and everything in between, if you've heard it, Nashville's got it. But ever since I moved to the city in 2013, I've met some incredible musicians who fall in between the cracks. Amazing musicians who are passionate about that other music. So I'm not here to talk about the music you've probably heard. I'm here to introduce you to them, illuminate their music, and share their stories. My name is David Rogers. I'm an improviser, composer, and pianist here in Music City, USA. And I want to welcome you to the Improviser's Corner. On today's episode, I get the opportunity to speak with bassist, improviser, and band leader, Greg the Watchman Bryant. We discussed his love for film, his role as a musical advocate, and how his roots in journalism still play a role in his musical storytelling. Well, I'm here with Mr. Greg, the Watchman, <laughs> and um, oh, this is just such a pleasure and honor. Thanks for, for having me. me. The, uh, I think I first was aware of you through the Golden Times films uh -huh. feature on you. Uh, okay. And I don't know if that was your idea uh, or Dara's idea, but maybe speak a little bit about Oh, that. man. That was, that was her brainchild. Okay. That was her idea. Um, she had gotten a new piece of equipment. Dara is, is a comprehensive artist. Um, she's a wonderful songwriter, wonderful singer, um, but she's a budding documentarian. Wow. And uh, she had gotten some new gear and wanted to test it out. And she saw this thing in New York, I forget, Capsulosity was the name of the series. Mm -hmm. And she's like, we don't have one of those. And there aren't enough people putting the spotlight on uh, improvisational musicians in this area right so it started out kind of to highlight some members of this community but it's grown and shifted to you know folks regardless of genre deserving some wider recognition as it is so golden time films is her situation um i'm just there really as a creative consultant mm -hmm. in the cutting room she'll say i need you to sit down and check this out what do I need to do differently? Do you like this? How's this hitting you? Um, and I have a, a journalism background. That's what I study. show was great uh, it debuted at number six on the itunes jazz charts which is crazy yeah. we have no label we have no pr person right now you know it's just a real blessing and privilege to have people accept uh and start to to understand what you do um and, and it hasn't gone without watering and planting but um there's, there's got to be more of that but we're thankful to have just a little glimpse of, of harvest, if I can say. Yeah, like that. absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. I got to play beside one of my heroes and right. another two of my heroes, Dara, Derek Phillips. Yeah. Um, our great buddy Giovanni Rodriguez is on it as well. Maybe speak a little bit about working with and alongside Charlie Hanna. Oh, man. Both uh, wow. bass players and amazing musicians, each in your own rights. Oh, man. What was that experience like? It was a beautiful nightmare. <laughs> um, Charlie's a friend. Um, he's also a person that um, musically has been a mentor to me. <laughs> to play beside him, I did conceptualize like, how do I pretend like I'm his thumb and forefinger? You know, those that may not know, he plays this hybrid guitar. Mm -hmm. It started out as an eight string with three bass strings, five lead strings. That reduced to a seven string, which was one less on the lead guitar side. Okay. Now he plays a six string guitar, but it's still a hybrid instrument. Three and three, three bass strings, I think. 
and three lead strings. So he conceptualizes all this music at the same time. And I tell everybody, hands down, one of the best bass players, I think, that's alive right now. So yeah. the challenge was um, momentous, but I feel like uh, he heard where I was and I was able to hear where the music was going, mm -hmm. being familiar with Dara's work. Sure. And it was really a, a, a beautiful relationship musically. Uh, and I hope people can hear this record and not be too upset that Charlie isn't playing his <laughs> native instrument. But man, he sounds killer on Telecaster yeah. and on 335. Like, you know, he started as a plain old guitar player first yeah. before he developed the hybrid thing. So not to drove on and on about it, but man, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. One that um, I hope to have again. And um, yeah, man, I'm just yeah. really thankful and grateful. That's, that's pretty unique how it experience. Turned out. It really, it really was. It yeah. really was. Yeah. We we spoke a little bit about the role of film, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. I've I've always appreciated your your social media, both you and Dara, uh -huh. the way you promote your shows, oh, very thanks, unique. Man. Wow. Um, with, with the way you combine video and, and music and humor. Uh -huh. and, um, uh -huh. and, and so I imagine, just from the outside looking in, that there is a role that, that film and storytelling plays in your own music. Mm -hmm. Is that, would that be an I think so. Accurate. It, it's, and it's starting yes. to do so more naturally, mm -hmm. I think. Um, back when we first really started the concept apart in our own bands and together in, in hers, we were always hearing from PR people, what's the story of this record? What's the story of this period? And we're like, well, story, well, we got tunes. And this yeah. But that's what people want more of. But in a natural progression, I guess I'll speak for myself. Sure. Um, I like weird mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Um, and it's a struggle to get people's attention without being uh, shocking <laughs> or, or riding the borders of what might be you know decent or bannable you know so it's like if i can catch your attention on instagram for 45 seconds with this crazy you know play out of like claymation wrestling <laughs> yeah. you know or you know godzilla you know breathing down a town <laughs> you know and then put my flyer on the end of it well hey man i got you it's, it's <laughs> right. just one of those things it's it's just silly um and that's a brief side of humor. You know, I'm not the biggest joker, but just I find little ways to insert. And Dara's helped bring that out of me some, sometimes. So, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> still grappling with all that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how would you describe your own music or your own artistry, maybe? Um, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. probably am more an advocate of music. Mm. If I can turn you on to music through, hey man, check out this Thelonious Monk record. Mm -hmm. Check out this um, Robert Glasper album, or check mm. out this Vijay Iyer record, or mm. check out The Last Poets, mm. or A Tribe Called Quest, or Kendrick, or whatever it is, then I've done my job. If I play music from a perspective that causes you to be curious or to choose whether you like it or not, that's my job. You know, Sun Ra said that he was a tone scientist. He didn't use the word musician. Mm -hmm. And for years, I identified more with that line yeah. of thinking. But as I've really done some more like self-searching about it, I think my job is to turn people on to a certain brand of music, which involves improvisation. Mm -hmm. But in whatever form that I do it, then I'm pleased. So whether you see me at a show, whether we rap and we exchange music to check out, mm -hmm. um, whether I do a podcast or I used to DJ, I DJ'd on the air for like 15 years off and on, it's all related. It's all the same thing to me. So it's just like I'm a conduit to help good music get to, to people.
phrase just now, but I think you're the one who first hit me to the term, which Nicholas Payton, I think, may have coined mm -hmm. Black American music. Absolutely. B -A -N, B -A -N. Absolutely. And I think that's a, when you, when I heard that from you, everything sort of clicked. Because mm. I think subconsciously we all know that it's all, there, there is a progression and Absolutely. there is a line that's all connected. Absolutely, man. Um, but I think that's kind of a, an, a really succinct <laughs> way and maybe, maybe the most honest way of describing some of those musics that you were, uh, you just mentioned. Nicholas has caught a lot of fire from certain people who don't understand. That's not an exclusive term. That's right. an inclusive term. Yeah. You know, when we talk about um, Duke Ellington in the 30s, mm. talking about we shouldn't call this music jazz. We should call it black music because we establish where the origin is right. so that it can be celebrated, so that we can have dignity, but use this as a way to um, interact with people right. on, on an even term, have something special that, that we can present that people can catch on to so that it'll be inclusive. And I really thought about that. Miles Davis hated that word. He said mm -hmm. that when you say the word jazz, you're already putting yourself into, pardon the phrase, but a ghetto. It's mm -hmm. like people want to pay you less. Wow. People want to treat you as second class because it's associated with something they don't understand or they don't feel like has dignity. <laughs> I, I definitely feel like um, the music that I play and the music that we play when we improvise is out of that tradition. Um, and not to steal from Nicholas, I've definitely used that hashtag when I promote my personal things. But I say other music because I definitely believe in the Black experience. But again, I don't know how to really define it. I don't, I know where it comes from, right. but where it ultimately ends up is something that I prefer to be like nebulous or an X, but when you hear it, you recognize what it is. And I feel like branding is important. He helped me to realize that as well. And I intend to continue like promoting music from that perspective because people need to understand like, it's all of what we do. I think that we all have things that maybe we spend our time outside of music, even if it's just like a guilty pleasure or something. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about, um, for you, is there anything outside of the world of music that you go to for leisure or um, to recharge if you ever get burnt out or for inspiration? Man, that's, that's, that's hard. I wish I could be hip and say, yeah, but no. I mean, wow. if I'm not playing, I'm, I'm trying to listen to you know something that brings me pleasure yeah you know i'll watch some you know uh low attention television uh -huh. i'm not really the reality show guy but i'll look at like old shows you know old comedies or mm -hmm. something like that to just kind of like <laughs> bring everything down sure. um i was reading a lot more maybe six six or seven years ago mm -hmm. um and my background is actually not as a music educator and I didn't study music in school. I studied journalism. Wow. So like I was a news junkie um, by compulsion because we had to. And then when that kind of got further and further away from, you know, my current path, you know, I kind of stopped watching so much news and now I don't watch it at all because it's just, you know, heartbreaking, yeah. you know, what, what has become um, this, of this country and that's another uh, situation but man honestly like for me music fulfills the role that movies fulfill for some people wow so if I'm listening to something like Lee Morgan search for the new land that's a story mm -hmm. that's a Shakespeare novel hmm. you know that's relaxation you know it can be romantic it can be fiery passionate it can be arresting but i feel like a lot of people limit what music can do for them even us as musicians because we're so analyzed oh man he played a b flat triad over <laughs> this is but no man but how did it make you feel right did it connect with you what he did yeah. 
is this causing you to have thoughts about how your life could be different because it's putting you in a certain a certain space and i think it's good to take a a, a break from from music but i i feel like we don't always allow music as musicians to do what it does for non-musicians and for me if i was on a desert island i just need some records i don't even need a bass wow. just give me some records and i'll be good yeah yeah i think i think i read a quote from herbie in an interview once where he said his mm-hmm. goal was to be able to hear and experience music like normal people or non-musicians wow wow and I, when i first read yeah. that I, that really hit home <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what am i doing yeah. how am i just yeah um You mentioned journalism. Is that where you got your nickname, The Watchman? Um, not exactly. Um, I was doing a study when I was maybe seventh grade, maybe sixth grade. Okay. What the name Greg meant, and it means the Watchman. Oh wow! So it's kind of like you know, the 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 not the general so much, but the cat who's who's on guard, mm. who's 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 keeping vigil. Mm-hmm. That's what it means. So I just stored that in the back of my mind. But I had a radio show the last time I was on broadcast radio, which was, oh gosh, um, 10 years ago now. Okay. And I was like, you know what? I'm starting to play more gigs in town. And not that it's a violation of any kind of rule, but I want to see if I can keep this separate from what I'm doing musically as a live performer. And that's the first time I ever went with that moniker. The Watchman. Okay. I just remembered it from the earth. It's like, it's still Greg, but they don't know it's me. So <laughs> yeah, that's how I got that name. And I've just used it. I had a podcast for a while and I used it there and interchanged it with, you know, my real name and stuff like that. But um, yeah. it just kind of stuck after that show was over and people, you know, call me that. And, it, and it's cool. You know, I'm, I'll, I'll answer to that. That's, that's what my name means. So yeah, it's, it's more of a it was a moniker, kind yeah. of an alias for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, yeah. I feel like maybe not every seventh or eighth grader is that aware <laughs> yeah. to, be, to be digging and remembering yeah. things like that. Is there any advice that you would give that younger self or anything now that you might say to that eighth grader or seventh grader, knowing what you know now? Anything? Um, hmm. That kid? No. He he was all right, and not and he wasn't perfect, but he was he was all right. He was all right. Man, I'm one of the two people from Nashville, if you can believe. Oh, wow. But um, I lived in Chicago for like two years, a little over two years. I lived in D.C. for maybe only like five, six months. Okay. But both of those cities were very crucial in my musical development. Yeah. Um, when I graduated MTSU, um, I left for Northwestern University to do my master's in journalism. Okay. And it was so intense. That program is like, first or second in the country. Yeah. Um, but on the weekends, like you were saying earlier, I needed to get away from that because it was so like all encompassing. Mm-hmm. So I would go down to the jazz showcase in Chicago or the Green Mill or whatever and hang. And I got to see so much music, man. I won't even run the list down, but just like heroes, people who are no longer with us now, sure. I got to see. And it was just like osmosis, right? Just every weekend, just taking in this stuff, taking in this stuff. In DC, I got to go to these jam sessions at this place, I don't think it's there anymore, called HR 57. Okay. It was jam sessions every night. It was a house band, then they would open it up. But man, I tell people this all the time, the way the cats swing on the East Coast, Mm -hmm. there's an intensity to that that's nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And when I play time, walk in time, that's really my conception of what it is. So like when I moved back here, I may not have had the vocabulary to pull it off, but I had some of the rhythm to pull it off. And I've worked and worked and worked at that 
over and there's a real like visceral it comes from living in a shoebox and having to stand in the cold and wait you know 30 minutes for a train or a thing that gets into the playing man yeah. and there's nothing like it there's yeah. nothing like it did mention Chicago and DC. Mm -hmm. Maybe speak a little bit about Nashville now and mm -hmm. being from Nashville yeah. and having from what I can guess and gather seeing it transform over your lifetime. How has the city and the communities, the people here, um, the venues, lack of venues, mm -hmm. uh, how has all of that channeled into you, your sound and how you create? Hmm. If at all. I think I, I would have to say it's great that so many folks from diverse backgrounds have moved here. Mm. That has influenced my playing because different perspectives, um, they rub off on you in, in good ways. Um, how has it affected my playing? I would say interacting with cats like yourself, coming in with strong and developing concepts from different areas in the country, different listening experiences, different pedagogical experiences. Um, it's really helped me be more of a comprehensive player, I would say. Okay. Um, I will add to that, um, I try to manifest what's inside outwardly. So a lot of times the sound that you're hearing is coming from a particular perspective. Mm -hmm. um, being from the South, um, we like the blues. We like rustic gospel. We like it every so often when we can see somebody in the crowd who may, you know, clap their hands or pat their feet, you know, nod their head. That's a sign that we're we're, we're reaching, yeah. we're reaching the people. But at the same time, like. I'm an explorer. Mm -hmm. So someone like Ornette Coleman, who says that sound itself is equal to rhythm, is equal to harmony, mm. is equal to melody. It's all the same, not one supporting another. They all have equal value. That's important to me as well. So when I can introduce people to that, he called it harmelotics, you know, when I can introduce people to some of that, um, I feel like I'm helping to add to the um, discussion about what music can be. Yeah. Um, that advocate. Ab exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Rhythm is the whole deal. But also there's these other things, <laughs> you know, that can be juxtaposed, you know, that can sit side by side, you know, and you can like it. And then come away saying, you know, I didn't think I liked X, but you've helped me to understand that I dig this. Where can I get some more of that? Right. That's cool, man. Yeah, man. Well, I would love to play. Let's get down. You got me all fired up. Absolutely, man. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>